Good evening, welcome to the Town of Isa Planning Board meeting for October 13th. Uh, we have one public hearing item on the agenda this evening and the rest are decision items. Uh, we remind applicants to keep presentations to 30 minutes and those members of the public who would like to speak to please fill out a yellow card in the back. We'll call you up during the public hearing and we ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. That being said, we'll go to the first item on the agenda, Town Board Application Public Hearing, Global Team LI LLC, CZ2021-018, Southeast Corner of Main Street, State Route 27A and Smith Avenue, Islip, 410 Main Street. Happen request to change the zone from an overlay of planned landmark preservation district and a Town Board Special Permit pursuant to Town Code Section 68-451.A3 in order to modify the density and dimensional requirements of the existing business district for a mixed use building. Applicant further requests a certificate of appropriateness for the material change of appearance for the existing building. Site plan modifications are required as part of this application. Good evening to the applicant. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, Guy W. Germano, 4250 Veterans Memorial Highway, Holbrook, New York, for the applicant, G-E-R-M-A-N-O. For the applicant, Global Team, L-I-L-L-C. I have here today with me representing the applicant, Andrew Castine and Simon uh, Blitz, owners of Global Team, uh, L-I-L-L-C. Also is David Bush, project architect, Bush Associates. Ethan Sakowski, project traffic engineer, Atlantic Traffic Designs, and Victoria Ryan, community outreach consultant for the project. The applicant seeks approval to reuse and renovate the Islip Theater built in 1947 and located at 110 East Main Street. I think you're all familiar with it. Uh, it's across the street, and this is the building here. Can you, can you see this? Okay, that's the building. It's across the street, the corner of Main and Smith. Um, Uh, the, in order to provide for a 2,900 plus or minus square foot ground floor restaurant with an open garden entrance and 23 apartment units. The concept of adaptive reuse of the existing theater would result in the preservation of the building on the west end of Main Street, which will present as a bookend to its counterpart, the Meridian Lofts. The project seeks to attract young professionals by creating attractive apartments using exist, the existing footprint of the building and beautify the existing brick facade while celebrating the building's 75 year old history. <clears throat> in, uh, in 2003, the then theater owner obtained approval from uh, the planning board of the town of Islip to expand the number of viewing screens to five with a seating capacity of, of up to 821 persons. And approximately three years later, the theater closed and the property was auctioned. From, 20, from 2009 to 2013, the building remained dark, it was unkempt and became a blemish on the community. After a failed attempt by the owner to open a daycare center, the theater was renovated and reopened in 2013 before closing permanently in 2020 due to the impact of the COVID crisis. I think we all remember the theater in its final days because I took my grandkids there. Um, it was deteriorated, dilapidated. There was a mildew smell, uh, with rugs and everything. It was really had deteriorated quite a bit. Um, and I, the, um, the applicant, Global Team LI LLC, through the owners Andrew Castine and Simon Blitz, were responsible for the major renovation and reutilization of the Domney Building in Bayshore. I don't know if you can see this. Is that what you're Domney Building? The building was, the Domini building was renovated, extensively renovated and remodeled in 2006, 2007 and reopened with 20 apartments on the second floor 
and right now approximately 12 uh, commercial units on the ground floor. The size of the commercial units varies by the needs of the tenant. But it's fully occupied. This was, I live in Bayshore, this, this was one of the first extensive renovations to Main Street and helped, and helped with the eventual um, <clears throat> rebirth of Bayshore. Uh, I lived there at the time, and I know what the Domini building looked like before uh, Mr. Castine and Mr. Blitz uh, did, the, did this fine job. And so they still own the building, so they're owners and operators, and I think this speaks volumes to their intent for the current pro proposed project. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I just want to, uh, at this point, just point out to the board, and I think you have, uh, uh, you've probably received a copy of this. This is a rendering of the completed building, which uh, Mr. Bush will go through in great detail. But you can see um, the window treatments, extensive window treatments. And this is, this is the entrance area, which is going to become an open garden. Garden entrance, and the roof is going to be removed. This is the current entrance. Uh, I think this will be a very attractive addition to Main Street uh, in Iceland. To facilitate the reuse of the empty theater, the applicant requests a change of zone to the PLP overlay district pursuant to section 68-447 of the Iceland code. Also a special permit pursuant to section 68-451A3 to modify the density and dimensional requirements of the existing business district in order to permit the reutilization of the theater um, as the applicant requests for his project. Specifically, a, 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 an increase in the FAR uh, from 1.0 to 2.1 is requested, an increase in the height for a small portion of the building from the existing 40 feet, six inch parapet. That's the parapet there. And this is actually um, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be visible from the front. And also to permit the existing lot area, corner lot, second front yard, and rear setbacks to remain as they currently exist, as, as they've existed since 19. 47 when the theater was first constructed. We also request a certificate of appropriateness from the planning board for a change to the appearance of the existing building pursuant to section 68-452 of the code in order to permit the adaptive conversion of the theater, the restaurant and loft departments. To a restaurant and loft apartments. You can slow me up anytime. <laughs> um, with regard to parking, the existing site does not permit on-site parking. It never has. In 2003, the, the, uh, theater, the theater renovation approval approved a, a seating capacity of up to 821 seats. And that required approximately 216 parking spaces under the code. The conditions of approval provided for the applicant, conditions of that approval, provided for the applicant, among other things, to improve the parking lot on Smith Street, pursuant to the requirements of the planning board. And that, that's that parking lot right here. Um, the theater was approved with available public parking because none was provided on site. <clears throat> the proposed adaptive reuse requires 78 parking spaces pursuant to the current town code. This is a reduction from the prior approval for as a theater use of 138 spaces. This project will revitalize the worn and tired unused building as illustrated in the concept plan with expansive windows, gardens, and terraces. The apartments will feature an industrial loft-like appeal and the existing brick exterior will be retained. At this point, I'm going to ask project architect, Mr. David Bush, to 
uh, explain the landmark significance of this project of the Islip Theater, its place in the community pursuant to the terms of the PLP overlay district and to walk the board through the architectural plans and revisions necessary to convert the theater into a mixed use uh, loft building. Good evening, Chairman, members of the board, community. Thank you for hearing us this evening. Again, for the record, my name is David Bush, B-U-S-C-H. My address, my business address is 90 West Main Street in Bayshore. Um, I'm a registered architect representing the Global Team LLC, as uh, Guy had indicated. The, um, I, I, we just handed out some 11 by 17 drawing packages, which was submitted of record. So it's the same exact package that was submitted to the planning board with the application, right? But so everybody has something in front of them. As Guy introduced, the application before us is the change of zone for an overlay of planned landmark preservation district and a town board special permit for mixed use building. A certificate of appropriateness is requested for the material change of appearance of the existing building. To state this simply, the applicant seeks approval for an adaptive reuse of the Bacon Islip Movie Theater building. The existing property is currently zoned as business district, BD. The change of zone is for an overlay of the, the PLP district to create the adaptive reuse. Within the Plan Landmark Preservation Overlay District, the legislative intent within section 68-447 uh, clearly states, and to paraphrase some of it, the PLP is designed to provide regulations and special conditions to enhance, perpetuate, perpetuate and use places, buildings, having a character of special historical or aesthetic, aesthetic, aesthetic interest and value. perpetuate and use places and buildings having a special character or historical, or special historical aesthetic interest or value. More specifically, there are seven points to the legislative intent. First one, to promote economic and general welfare of Islip. Second one, to safeguard significant features of the town's historic, aesthetic, scenic, and cultural heritage through physical evidence of the town's evolution. So to preserve and recognize evolution, to foster civic pride and beauty of the past, to encourage a more desirable use of land and site design in the vicinity of such significant, historic, aesthetic, scenic, and cultural features through the applications of standard as will protect and upgrade their character and value. To recommend new uses of the land where there are unused and underused uses. To strengthen the economy of the town. And final point, to stabilize and improve the property values and protect the town's tax revenues. Those are the seven points direct from the planned landmark preservation overlay district, section 68-447, and the design intent of that legislation. To reflect on the Islip Theater, it has a unique history. Within the application package submitted to the, the planning board, there was a document titled the Islip Theater Culture and Community Overview. Within the documents, the history, culture, and community aspects of the theater are, are documented. I would like to read some of the highlights and paraphrase for the audience. Prior to 1946, the property was a vacant lot. It was actually a hay field. The Islip Theater, in April 5th, 1947, at its gala opening on a Saturday evening. The price of a seat at the time for an adult, 35 cents. That included six cents tax. 
The opening program included such items as the News of the World, a sporting review, a Donald Duck cartoon, the national anthem, and a dedication, a special dedication by the Islip Chamber of Commerce by Supervisor Charles Dorier. Dorier, D-U-R-Y-E-A, of the theater. The featured movie was the Zigfield Follies. <clears throat> the theater has other uh, historical significance. The building itself. The architect for the Islip Movie Theater was a Mr. John Eberson. John was a European-born American architect by practice, best known for the development and promotion of movie palace designs. John was described as the Johnny Appleseed of theater goers. Johnny Appleseed of theater goers designed our theater in Islip on Main Street. He traveled around the eastern part of the US promoting opera houses in small towns. John's first theater was built in 1904, the Hamilton Jewel in Hamilton, Ohio. Interestingly, it was an existing building, a pre-Civil War building that was an adaptive reuse of an existing structure, similar to our proposal here this evening. Perfected as a new, a new theater design, John was uh, renowned for his atmospheric theater style. This movie Palace Theater was popular in the 1920s and designed to evoke a feeling of a particular time, place for patrons of architectural elements and ornamentation that evoked a sense of being outdoors. This was intended to make a patron more active in a participant, more a, a patron, a more active participant in the setting. John's son, Drew Eberson, joined his firm as an architect and continued movie practice, movie palace design practice through their firm in New York City. I note this because as a revered movie palace architect, Mr. Eberson had approximately 27 theaters listed on the National Register of Historic Places. These designated theaters occurred in several states across the country, as well as internationally in areas like Palace, Paris, France. Beyond Mr. Everson's theaters of distinction of National Register, some of Mr. Everson's other local Long Island theaters include the Amity Prudential Playhouse in Babylon, the Amity Prudential Playhouse in Babylon, it's Babylon Drive-In, the Nesconset Drive-In in Smithtown, the Babylon Anwell Theater in Brooklyn, Binny Shell's Theater in Shirley, Binny, B-I-N-I, Shell's Theater, Shirley, the Brookhaven Theater in Port Jeff, and a, a theater in Northport called the Prudential Playhouse. He also did the concert stage at the City College in New York City. In the same year he did this theater, in 1947, they both opened. He has many, he has several distinguished New York accomplishments, um, which I can continue about. Beyond his theater accomplishments, his 27 National Register noted accomplishments, his uh, other theaters on Long Island. In 1938, Mr. Eberson did his first engagement in Bayshore. It was an apartment house for a Mr. J.M. Sider, S-E-I-D-E-R. One of his other interesting New York projects was a theater building in Bedford, uh, in Bedford, New York. It was a project that was originally designed as an apartment and theater building. The building still stands. Presently, the building is a cafe and an apartment program. We refer to this project because it is noteworthy of reference as, a his, as historically since 1946, the apartments have been the successful staple component while the commercial program has adopted change, presently as a cafe. On positive notes, the gala opening 1947 presented proceeds and the orgel donated to the churches of Islip. Throughout its life, the theater was used as, edu as an educational support component for many children-based community events. There were events that included such activities as dunking for apples in large tubs of water, cracker eating contests in which children ate three crackers, and then the first one to whistle a tune won. The theater supported school events from within Islip schools and community programs. For an example, after reading a book and a movie came out, Polar Express, as an example, in 2004, 
parental groups like Parents as Reading Partners, PARP, B-A-R-P, or other classroom events would schedule viewings of the movie at the theater and afterwards engage in academic dialogue with the children. The theater was a place of children. The place was a theater. Of, uh, the theater was a place for children within the community to schedule birthday parties as well. Halloween events. Over many years, the theater actively participated in many Halloween events. Some of which was may recall participating with our children after watching a scary movie, participating in a, a community bonfire many years ago, and listen to dark, listen to scary stories in the dark. Even with its revitalization in 2013, the theater sought to maintain its Halloween heritage with costume events for children. The theater has been locally operated and affordable. However, in more recent years, the theater has struggled. Since the events of 2020, the community outlook has declined with its closure. Although it has historically had great pricing compared to large multiplex theaters, the dingy atmosphere, the lack of proper ventilation, the smell of wet carpet, and poor snack collections, selections, have caused community members to turn to larger corporate multiplex venues. Hence, it's an inevitable non-reopening. Time, transition, and operational challenges. 1947, it's grand opening. 1940. 1981. Mr. Bush, Mr. Germano, I just want to let you know you're down to 10 minutes. I don't know if you want to get into the specific details of the sure. project itself as opposed to the history. Okay. I apologize. I didn't realize I had a time limit. I'll get to it. Thank you. The theater was triplexed. In 2013, it became, um, it had been referenced as a blemish to the community in news articles. Again, thank you for your patience and reflection on the history. It's important that, that we recognize the heritage Again, because this is an adapter, a proposal of adaptive reuse. It is not a proposal to knock a landmark building down, but an opportunity to maintain a culturally significant building to revitalize and anchor the Western Gateway to Main Street of the Hammond of Iceland. I'd like to walk you through the drawings that I submitted. Sheet A1. So if I can just suggest that you turn that around so the members of the community who are here can see that we all have a copy up here. CD1 is a site location plan, as Guy had identified. The building, the ISO Theater is on the southeast corner of Main Street and Smith, diagonally across from this building where we sit today. At a height of 40, approximately 40 feet tall, it stands as an opportunity of the gateway to the Islip Main Street. We go to the next sheet. The existing site analysis, drawing A1.1. The existing building is approximately 15,000 square feet. The entry to the existing building is on the corner of Main Street and Smith Avenue. The existing diagonal um, corner provides for ticketing and lobby areas, concession, toilet rooms, and three theaters. The building sits on the site with a near lot line construction on three sides, with site relief to its west along Smith Avenue. It has a 15, approximately 15 foot setback in the south wing and a 35 foot setback to its inner wall. The existing building fronts along Main Street is approximately 40 foot six inches tall. Above that, there is a bow framed roof truss beyond the parapet that it has a ridge height of approximately 45 to 46 foot, which you cannot see from the street tapers up. The FAR of the existing building is a 1.0. As per the CO public summer and the public assembly records, the theater was approved for seating within three theaters. Theater one permitted 299 seats, theater two similar 299 seats, and theater three permitted for 264 seats. It's a total of 862 seats. <clears throat> the next sheet, sheet A1.2, the proposed site plan is an adaptive reuse. The program proposes a mixed use of restaurant and apartments. The site area remains unchanged as does the building perimeter at grade with no changes to existing setbacks. The single, the single story pavilion at the corner is an unroofed gateway entry garden. The new program adapts the existing build, 
foot building footprint at grade for a restaurant of approximately 2,900 square feet, an outdoor dining space, and a total of 23 residential apartments within. The FAR proposed is 2.1, which I'll speak to in a little bit. The height of the building in the middle of the building, as stated, is upwards of about 45 to 46 foot. I'm sorry, the height of the proposed um, new structure in the middle is a loft and it's pulled in from the edges is approximately 49 feet while maintaining the existing parapet heights at the main street at 40, approximately 40 foot, six inches. The parking required for the new program is 78 spaces, substantially less than the 216 spaces for the theater. With a look at the ground floor plan, The restaurant fronts along Main Street with four studio apartments, a fitness space, and other building services to the south. At the corner of Main, Main and Smith, the existing single story pavilion is unroofed as an entry garden and becomes um, uh, a place for patrons to gain access to interior and exterior dining. The residential apartments are provided with a separate tenant entrance featuring a tenant entrance. featuring a drop-off area into the cur existing curb cut line, along, re along with relief space of the existing building. There's a curb cut within the relief space of the existing building along Smith Avenue. 8.1.3, the second floor plan, demonstrates an infill program with a total of 10 residential units, nine studios, and one one bedroom, with a relief at the west elevation. Sheet A1.4 is the proposed third floor plan. Again, an infill program with a total of nine residential units, three studios, five duplex lofts, one bedroom. At the third floor, there is also an indoor-outdoor tenant common space set within the existing brick walls of the building of the south. And similarly, we see relief at the west elevation. Sheet A1.5 is the proposed fourth floor plan. These are the upper lofts of the third floor units with open space to the living, living space of the third floor unit below. The lofts are only accessed via an interior stair internal to the unit below. They are part of the third floor unit. Drawing A1.6, the proposed concept design, it's an exterior rendering, which is here. It demonstrates the adaptive reuse of the building or from a new gateway to the west end of the ice at Main Street. It maintains the existing brick masonry walls and the Main Street parapet details. It creates a new enhanced and warmer facade to Main Street using larger scaled windows, a sidewalk canopy, and a storefront to complement the existing architecture of the building and soften its position on Main Street. The entry, the existing entry is adapted by removing the roof of the entry pavilion and creating an open air entry garden while substantially preserving the lines of the existing structure and creating a new gated threshold to the existing theater that was and now serving the restaurant. The west elevation creates a uniform puncture of windows along the west elevation with one primary volume to introduce the lofts as the, to the west and the garden spaces below. The new volume softens the otherwise long industrial brick wall, complementing and enriching the existing masonry and creates a welcoming energy to the elevation to the Wesley Street approach. The volume also gestures to the location of the tenant entry garden along the west side of the building. Sheet A1.7 is the unroofed entry garden. These are concept images that speak to the maintenance um, the idea of the entry garden that we're from, we're going to maintain the exterior brick walls. We're going to punch some holes and make some gated thresholds, but it's an indoor outdoor space. It's unroofed and you have soft pedestrian arrival um, again to interior and exterior dining. This, this idea complements the original architecture of Mr. Everson and his goals in creating atmospheric theater style entries. Sheet A1. Eight is the apartment lofts. Again, image concepts adapt the existing exterior brick wall into the interior space, bring in daylighting, wall punctures, and introduce lofts 
at the at five of the third floor units. Drawing A1.9 is an indoor outdoor patio space. It occurs at the third floor as noted. These are images of the concept, maintaining the exterior brick shell, brick shell, the exterior brick shell, the exterior brick masonry, and providing um, a wall so that the terrace space is internal of the building, but open to the sky above. Sheet A1.10 existing and proposed. It's a simple side by side look of the current lighted building, the current lighted vacant building and the proposal of an adaptive reuse to maintain the prominence of an iconic isolated theater building while offering a revitalization of the new gateway to the west end of Main Street. This proposal provides for all the legislative intent of the PLP district. It provides for preservation and perpetuation preservation of a landmark and culturally significant structure at the west end of Main Street. That is significant in marking the western gateway of the Islip Hammett, Main Street, and community fabric. It's a preservation of a piece of movie palace history by preserving the envelope of a theater building as designed by an internationally renowned architect, Mr. John Everson. Further, we preserve the action of the architect's history as an adaptive reuse of the theater's mirrors the first design of the architect to adapt a, to adaptively use a Civil War building in the creation of performance. In preserving the Main Street iconic mass, the exterior brick, we perpetuate the memories of the community as well. Programmatic enhancement, the adaptive reuse is the live performance that the theater brings to the Main Street community for its continued success. The mixed use building with restaurant space at the ground floor apartments is a proven staple to the success of Main Street districts. The program promotes more patrons to visit, engage, and participate in commerce within neighboring retail and restaurants along Main Street and Islip by extending this fabric. The restaurants and its garden offer a public destination to reflect and an opportunity of new memory. One more minute. The adaptive reuse of the structure preserves the memory and the cultural history of the community of the original structure. In a sense, we are following suit of the historical design intent and style. The architectural historical building honors the particular time it was constructed, but introduces architectural elements and materials that correlate with the present day. The proposal includes a hallowing out of a single story portion of the existing building as an unroofed transitional entry courtyard to enhance the sense of being outdoors while in the shell of the building that remains. This proposal is a revitalization of a currently claimed isolate Main Street garnish. It renews, strength, renews and strengthens and improves property values and tax revenue. Finally, the theater over time has clearly communicated that we should reflect and rejoice in our, his and rejoice in our history. That we should reflect and rejoice in our history. But it also tells us to listen. We can't live in the past. The theater wants to be a part of our progress, it's saying. Within its setting, the building's in a way hindering the progression of the Main Street, Islip Main Street, and, wants, and what it truly wants to be. It wants to be an anchor to mark the west end of Main Street and a continued community revitalization. Thank you for your patience. Mr. Germano, you're about at 35 minutes of your 30-minute presentation, just so you know. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, I, I'm not going to ask uh, our <clears throat> project traffic engineer. You, I think you've all received a copy of the traffic report. It's part of the record. He's going to walk you very quickly through the uh, essence of the report and the parking study um, that it, it involves. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief while also speaking slowly. Uh, it's e Ethan Chikoski. Uh, I'm a professional engineer with Atlantic Traffic and Design Engineering. Uh, we're located at 2929 Expressway Drive North, Hophog, New York. Uh, we prepared a traffic statement that was submitted under the record uh, dated September 7, 2021. I'll try not to rehash too much of the testimony that's already been given. Um, you know, 
as was already described, the town code requires one stall per four seats in the theater, requiring 216 off-street parking stalls, where none are provided today. Uh, the proposal would require 78 parking stalls. Um, that's a 138 stall reduction from the current requirement, or 64%. Uh, in addition, the mix of uses and development location in downtown Islip would result in a shared parking opportunity where peak residential parking demand in the overnight period would complement the peak res uh, downtown retail and service-oriented demand during the day. Uh, we performed a parking study, uh, conducted uh, weekdays, Friday and Saturday, to determine sufficient parking would be available to accommodate the demand generated by the proposed reuse. Uh, we observed the municipal parking field five, which is located on Smith Avenue down the road from our site right here, and then also parking field one, which is located just east of the building we're in, and then the parking for the uh, ice slip Town Hall West, uh, the building we're currently in and the, and the parking surrounding us here. Uh, we also looked at on-street parking on Main Street from Cedar Avenue to Grand Avenue. Uh, based on the data we collected, Municipal Lot 5 had an existing overnight occupancy of four vehicles um, with 49 uh, available parking stalls. Uh, based on Institute of Transportation Engineers parking projections, which is the industry standard for parking demand uh, analysis. Uh, it indicates an average demand of 28 stalls uh, for an overnight use for the 23 dwelling units. Uh, so municipal lot five can more than accommodate that demand. Uh, we also looked at the weekday PM and Saturday midday hours when restaurant parking demand is high um, and the commercial uses in the vicinity of the site are also generating parking demand. Uh, the proposed re reuse is estimated to generate demand for approximately 49 parking stalls. Uh, based on the observations conducted for the study, uh, the, the lots on the west side of Main Street here uh, are, are not as heavily utilized as the lots further east. Um, there are between 207 and 213 parking spaces available within walking distance of the of the proposed reuse. Uh, therefore, the parking supply is anticipated to be sufficient to meet parking demand during those peak demand hours. Uh, yeah. That basically summarizes our traffic analysis. Uh, we also looked at trip generation projections. Um, compared to the existing use, uh, there's there would be a reduction of, of traffic to the site, assuming um, a, a reuse of the theater. Uh, there'd be a max increase of 24 new one-way trips to the site uh, with, a, with a fully occupied restaurant and, and a residential building. So I'm available for any additional questions. Thank you. I, I just want to mention at this point, and I spoke to Sean, and I also spoke to uh, Amy Murphy in the town attorney's office, and um, we understand that um, the town attorney would be, um, I guess, with the permission of the board, uh, consider giving uh, the applicant a license for the use of a part of, not exclusive, but for the use of the Smith Street parking space spaces. Um, now I'd like to ask uh, Victoria Ryan to address the board, our community outreach consultant. Please go on. If, go ahead. Okay, uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Victoria Ryan. I'm the principal of VRPR, address, uh, VRPR, address of 73 South Penadiglet Avenue in Bayshore. 
I was going to speak extemporaneously about this application, but in the interest of saving time for both all of you and the folks that want to speak on the application, I'm going to just read my, my notes and make it as quick as possible. Um, first of all, I'd like to submit to you for the record a packet containing letters of support, the radius map, and a handout that was prepared uh, for the door-to-door -door outreach that I conducted in the neighborhood. Um, the radius map will just illustrate for you, for your information, the area that was covered in the door-to-door -door canvassing. Wendy, if I can hand this to you or to somebody. We'll make that part of the record. There should be seven copies. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Uh, I was retained by the applicant to provide community outreach services, specifically to help design the handout that you now have in your possession, and that contains information on the proposed project, including the renderings of the exterior and interior of the building, and other general information about the project that has already been uh, shared with you uh, to great extent this evening. Um, I do provide these outreach services to real estate developers throughout Long Island, and I've done so for over 10 years. For this project, I personally went door to door to the residences and the businesses located within the radius map on four separate occasions within the last two weeks. The radius map consisting of properties located within 200 feet of the subject parcel is promulgated by the Town of Bicep's Department of Planning. It is these properties that the town has identified as being the most impacted by the proposed project. However, I do go beyond the boundaries of the radius as evidenced by the addresses you will see on the letters. You will see eight signed letters of support from the surrounding residences and business operators. I believe at least two of them are here this evening to speak on the record. And that is all I have to say right now. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Germano. Sure, you're happy to hear that concludes our presentation. And Thank you. We're, we'll, you know, everyone's here to answer questions. We'll come back to questions. We'll do a public hearing and then we'll uh, go to a staff report and come back for questions. Uh, I'm going to go to Linda Linsenbarth. I gather that's my timer, huh? Okay. Uh, I'm Linda Linsenbarth. I am the owner of So What's New, which sits on the southwest corner of Maine and Smith. I, so, S-E-W, what's new? And yarn, too. Um, I sit on that southwest corner, and I am so fascinated that a community outreach person showed up last night at 5.30, when I usually close at 5.00, and this is the first, and I'd love to see this wonderful handout that I have not been given. And the only reason I'm here tonight is because of what was plastered on the doors of the building to, no to notify the world of this public note of this public hearing. Um, so I must say, as the owner of the business that will be so severely impacted by the construction, I don't object to changes. Okay, I only object to the fact that I'm going to be very severely impacted with parking. I feel that the entitlement that many people feel with their cars during will take themselves and park. And I am only, there's only two of us in the entire town that have parking right next to their buildings. That's the dry cleaner and me. And I would say that those eight spaces will have everybody drooling. And I, I want to know that whoever is doing this, whatever construction company, whatever, makes some sort of effort to protect my building's parking. The average age of my customer is 52. That means looking from all the gray hair, it's either your wives or sisters who are doing the quilting, the sewing, and the knitting, which is what my business caters to. When they come to my store for a class, they are carrying sewing machines that are 25 pounds minimum. Some of them go 
in parts and there, and if your wife does so, you will know what I mean. Anyway, um, not to mention that the average age of my employees is 60. And that includes a 31 year old. So you get the idea that we're dealing with old people who really need to be close to that building when they come to park. And oh boy, I will, I only ask that some effort, some concession be made that my parking not be blocked during construction by these construction workers, that some effort be made to the residents of this new apartment complex that they will not use my parking lot because the first thing I'm going to do is get a tow truck. <laughs> Thank you. Brittany Grando. Hello, um, my name is Brittany Grando. I'm a resident on Smith, um, a couple houses down from where this proposed project is. And while I agree with what you said that we all are eager for change and sick of looking at a vacant building, the, the block just doesn't allow for it. And you know, doing traffic studies during COVID when 80% of people are still working from home and children weren't in school and there weren't buses and weren't traffic and people aren't going out dining as much. Yes, maybe the lot has been a little bit more empty, but if you drove down Smith yesterday when the fire department was redoing their parking lot, buses couldn't get through, emergency vehicles couldn't get through. And that's with me and, our, me and my neighbors being respectful of the fact that we know that it's already a narrow block and not parking our cars on the street where we're allowed to park. There are no sidewalks, there is no traffic light. 23 apartments allows for a minimum of 46 people. We were told that that allows for 1.74 cars per apartment. The last time I checked, you can either buy one car or two cars. We're gonna go with two. There's 56 spots in that lot. So that's, do the math, What that's 10 spots. And there are a lot more. We all have pictures of the lot during the day and at night. And then you're not accounting for 20 employees in a restaurant and all of them. And in the past, I mean, historically in this town, the lot behind Starbucks never has parking. The lot here at 401 never has parking. I, the, sorry, I made notes. Um, the building that was Culture last year was proposed to put a restaurant there and they have their own parking lot and it was denied for lack of parking and the 401 building parking is in walking distance to that. So how can you put a restaurant that can sit 76 people comfortably with 46 residences but that now it's enough parking? It just doesn't make sense. And then its counterpart on the other side of town, the Meridian Lofts down by Tellers had to purchase a house behind the building to knock it down to make their own parking lot. And they also had to grandfather in some spots in the building just to the east of it, just to the east of it, which was purchased to meet the town's required parking. And there's a municipal lot on Oakney. So they had to have all of this parking that they owned and got grandfathered in by the town, and that is a fraction of the amount of apartments and tenants. And you know, a lot of people use Smith as the gateway to Sherwood Elementary School. I happen to have young children. We don't have sidewalks. People are flying up and down the block all the time. It, there's just not enough room for an additional 46 cars during school hours. Sherwood starts at 8.30 in the morning when everybody's leaving to go to work. How are you going to make this safe for our children and for the people that live on this block? Thank you. Thank you. Paula Alms. Paula Almas. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Almas. I live 63 Smith Avenue, so I'm just a few blocks uh, south of Brittany. And I have the same concerns as Brittany. She said it a lot better than I will probably say it because I'm nervous. But I just want a couple things that she didn't mention that I want to say. Um, my husband, he looked at the, the 
laundromat that was just built uh, a few blocks west on Main Street. And it's brand new, it's a beautiful building and they have a lot of parking. They, they, were, they were mandated to put parking in that parking lot in order to have that building. So our street, is a, Smith Avenue is a lot narrower than any of your other blocks in Isla. In fact, several years ago, I tried to get sidewalks on our street because I had young kids walking up to Sherwood and it was denied because the town doesn't even own as much property, so we couldn't get sidewalks. It's okay, there was one bad accident once where a child got hit by a car. I think you remember that, right? It was horrible. I don't wanna see that happen again. And the other thing that Brittany didn't mention is there's been so much talk about the meters going into Islip like we have now in Bayshore. So if you are gonna use the public parking lots for the apartments and for the staff of the restaurant, and there's going to be a meter is coming soon, then where are they going to go? I don't want them up and down the blocks in front of our house. She said it right. We all park our cars on the driveway so we can leave the street clear for the fire trucks, the buses coming through. That's very important. We are a narrow road. You have to consider that. And I don't know about the study he did. Nobody's going to be crossing Main Street at night to park their car. They're not going to go behind this parking lot. It's dark. Main Street's dangerous to cross. There's been accidents on Main Street. There's been a death on Main Street from crossing the street a couple of years ago. I don't know if you remember in front of near Tellers. Um, you know, it's too crazy. The, the speed limit is should be slower and there's sidewalks with crossing walks and nobody stops for them. So this is dangerous. Dangerous, we don't want to cause parking in front of our streets. You have to make sure that's all part of your plan. Now, I am for the apartments. I just think 23 is way too many. It's, I, I would like to see the building used. If there's a restaurant, I'll probably go to it. I go to all the others on Main Street, but you need to consider the parking and the traffic. That's it. I did it in less than three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Greg Pepe. Greg Pepe, ISLIP resident. The difference in what was and what's being proposed is that when you have a movie or attend the theater, people go home after it's over. Now you're going to have permanent residents, you're going to have restaurant uh, people coming to use the restaurant. And the parking is just not there. Smith Street is very vital, it's just like Union, because EMS and fire department needs that as access on 911 calls. Now, if we look at his plan, he's showing where there's, on Smith Street, there's cars, two cars parked in a entrance way, I believe he said to go to the restaurant. Now, if they're using this as a valet system, these cars are gonna back up on Smith Avenue. It's gonna hinder any kind of ambulance or fire rescue to, to leave that firehouse coming Smith Street northbound. Secondly, I don't know if people are aware of this, the parking spacing on Main Street in Islip, which is a state road, does not meet state requirements. There's 17 feet, zero inches, up to 17 feet, six. If you ever park in those spots, you'll see that some vehicles don't fit in length, and that's the reason why. Minimum requirement by New York State law and code is a minimum of 22 feet, okay? So now you have a bus stop in front of there right now, which is used by Suffolk Transit. What are they gonna do about that? You're losing spots, spots right there. Secondly, they do, cannot accommodate this type of parking. It will not work, okay? So first of all, before we spend so much money to fence man Inc. to section these parking spaces, okay? Because next is gonna be, they're gonna be numbered and then we're gonna be paid for parking. Okay, they're illegal. They're illegal and they should be done away with. And uh, from what I'm concerned is this is nothing more than an urbanization project. Loft apartments belong in New York City. You want a loft apartment and that type of lifestyle, go into New York, go back to New York City and, and you know, and enjoy that type of lifestyle. We're, we're urbanizing, I slip, it's getting totally out of control. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all the cards I have. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard that did not fill out a card? Come on up and just fill out a card afterwards.
Uh, hi, my name is Lisa Bernstein. I did, yes, B-E-R-N-S-T-E-I-N. I'm an ISIP resident, and it's more of a question. It's not necessarily a statement. I'm curious as to the percentage of apartments that might be subsidized housing. Thank you. We're, after the staff report, I'll ask those questions. Thank you. Anyone else wish to be heard on the application? Hi, my name is Dennis Palazzato. Palazzato, P-O-L-L-I-Z-O-T-T-O. -T -T -O. I live at 22 Smith Avenue. I live directly next to Parking Field 5. Um, been there since 2004. I think I know the traffic better than pretty much anyone or any traffic study that may have been done. The road, as previously stated, is very narrow. The fire department, which is directly across from my house, comes out onto Smith Avenue and it exits through Main Street. There is no way that traffic can get through with the fire department getting in and out. There is supposedly in the proposal that we saw that was handed out, um, drop off pickup service at the building cannot be done. The movie theater used to do it. People used to drop off their kids, go to the movies, whatever. It blocked traffic. Create, uh, created problems for people turning off of Main Street onto Smith, as well as those getting off of Smith onto Main Street, as well as the bus stop that's on the north corner of the movie theater currently. That's going to be a problem as well. There's just not enough room for any of this. 223 apartments, way, way too much. The parking, the narrow road, it just doesn't go together. I want to see something happen to the building. This is not the way to go about it. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone else wish to be heard? Not seeing anyone, I'm going to go to Mr. Colgan for a report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. As stated by the applicant, this application proposes a mixed use building with a restaurant and an existing movie theater building. The building would consist of approximately 2,900 square feet of restaurant space, 23 apartment units, and garden areas. Prior to this, the property has been the subject of a proposed dial Che Care Center in 2009. That application was ultimately withdrawn by the applicant at that time. The current proposal is to add the planned landmark preservation district as an overlay on the property, which will permit the proposed use the intent of the PLP is to protect, enhance, and use buildings, structures, and other objects having a special character or special historical or aesthetic interest or value. The subject structure received a certificate of occupancy in 1947. The structure is unique to downtown ISIP as it is of considerable size with a unique envelope that this application would propose to preserve. If the application is granted, the applicant will receive permission from the town board to exceed the maximum height and floor area ratio limits of the underlying business district zone, while ceding to the planning board control over the external appearance of the building. The surrounding Main Street area consists of predominantly business district zoning, which includes several restaurants and mixed use buildings. Generally, the staff is supportive of restaurants and mixed use buildings in downtowns as they create synergy among other businesses and decreased reliance on overall automobile use. It should be noted that the Masonic Lodge for the west of this location was also rezoned with a PLP overlay district back in 2014. The subject site has no on-site parking and would be reliant on municipal parking, primarily the lot on Smith Avenue. A traffic and parking study was submitted and reviewed by the town's independent traffic consultant. The consultant found that the proposed reuse of the existing movie theater building will generate significantly less traffic than the former movie theater use, and there is ample parking available in the existing municipal parking lot during the overnight hours to accommodate the proposed apartments. Uh, as per the town attorney's office, they are willing to negotiate an agreement with the applicant on the movie theater project for the non-exclusive use of the parking lot located on Smith Street if the town board approves the application. Uh, the building elevations add windows and visual interest to the structure while mostly preserving its shape size, scale, and brick exterior. Uh, but we did hear a lot of comments tonight, so the staff would recommend that the board reserve decision 
uh, in order to review them with the applicant. Thank you, Ms. Colgan. I'm going to go to Mr. Brown first. Okay, uh, Mr. Germano. Or, or maybe the, I'll ask you the question, maybe it's the architect, but I mean, ob the obviously the point that everybody loves the project. It's, you know, really good for the neighborhood. It's good for the building. It's good for Islip. Um, but we have a situation with parking. So that, that seems to be the main obstacle that we have to try to come over. Right now you have a fourth floor on the project. Is a fourth floor a... Uh, something that's 100% necessary for the project, which is about five units. Yeah, but the fourth floor doesn't contain it. It's it just the, just be close to the microphone. I'm sorry. The fourth floor is adds only height to the third floor loft apartments. But th there's five apartments on the fourth floor. No, no, no. It's just the ceiling. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the ceiling height on the fourth floor to give those those apartments. Um, that, that, that expansive loft look. Okay, I, okay, I was misreading that. Um, the other thing, is a possibility of making the apartments larger to cut down the number of them? Well, the apartments are uh, actually, they're already, I mean, the, this, the, the one bedrooms and I'm gonna say this average and the studios average about 800 square feet, give or take. The, law, the, uh, the duplexes are larger. Uh, they're studio apartments, and as a result, the likelihood is that they will not attract that many people because they or are school age. They won't be attracting school age no, children. No, there'll be too. none of that. And there's and if you look at the the layout of the apartments, you'll see that um, you enter through a door. There's there's only one window or doorway uh, in those studio apartments, hence. There's no window available for the bedroom, hence it's a studio, and you can't put a door there, so there's an open area uh, for the studio, but it's a separate sleeping area. Yeah, this is not going to attract school, you know, school-aged children. There's 16 uh, of these loft studio apartments. Uh, young people like them. Uh, young people are looking for places to stay. We all know that. And the new apartments that have been built in Bayshore and Oakdale and Islip, uh, they're essentially full because people are looking to live in these kinds of spaces. The other thing is by having the apartments in the downtown area, as Sean, as Sean mentioned, it, it, it actually is a traffic damper because people will tend to not use their car to go out to a restaurant or a bar, but they'll walk and they'll walk to the shops that are available. So. Uh, it actually tends to dampen down the traffic. A lot of people won't be leaving to go out at night, but they'll be walking, just like the neighbors in, in, in close by in Iceland do now. Well, I do see that in Patchogue. It's, it's the same thing. Okay. Mr. Fergari. Mr. Fergari. This is, this is not a question. Um, it, as Mr. Brown said, parking clearly seems to be the, the major concern with, with this application. And I just have a, a suggestion for you when, when everyone goes back to the drawing board to take a look at this. Um, you have a very nice site plan here with a, a beautiful tenant garden space off onto the west side of the building. And along Smith Street, you have two uh, sort of cut in parallel parking spaces. I'm wondering if you can take a look at, instead of two parallel parking spaces, some angled in spaces along Smith Street, angled heading, heading north um, so that you can accommodate more cars. You might end up having uh, parking for say eight additional vehicles and still be able to accommodate some tenant gardens. I just offer that as a suggestion for, for you to, to review. The other question that I had looking at, at the floor plan, is the elevator in the building an existing elevator? No. Okay, so then one, one other suggestion might be you have a studio apartment that abuts the restaurant, which if I was the tenant in that studio, I would be very concerned for noise and activity at, at the restaurant. So you have a fitness center, an elevator, mechanical building, a stairwell, and some building storage all the way on the south end of the building, if that utility type area was moved behind the restaurant, sort of as a buffer, and then you replace that area with another studio apartment, 
I'm just say, just take a look at that. It might make for um, a nicer apartment layout. That ends my question. Thank you. There's a question posed earlier, and either Mr. Germano or Mr. Colgan you can speak to affordability uh, com component of this. What percentage would be affordable? What well, affordability uh, yeah, means as well? We've, we've addressed this with planning staff. Um, pursuant to Islip Town regulations, 10% of the apartments will be listed as affordable and in New York. In, in, under the Islip Code in the Suffolk County, actually. That's 80% um, people re renting that apartment. It has to be rented to people who, and, and affordable to someone who is, uh, makes no more than 80% of the median income for Nassau Suffolk, which actually is pretty high. I'm not sure offhand what it is. It's close to a... Um, these are last year's numbers. These are 2021 numbers, excuse me, 2020 numbers, so they might be a little dated, but probably not terribly different. But the maximum rent for what we term an affordable unit for a studio will be approximately $800 a month, and a wet bedroom would be a, a little over $2,000 a month. So there would be three of those units in the building as pursuant to the requirements of the town. Thank you. And I know Mr. Brown brought it up, but the question is the size of the project. I think it's it's a good reuse of the project, it's a good reuse of the theater. The question becomes 23 apartments and what can be done in that regard. I think the building, the current size is 15,000 square feet. Is that accurate? No, that's the, that's the, the current. Uh, and it's going. The current site is 15,000 square feet. And the building is 15,000. There's also a little bit here. Yeah, there's two levels, so it's actually a little bit more than that. Okay, so and and what is it going to? It's going from point one FAR, which is fifteen thousand square feet, to uh, point two point two point two point one. Just to break okay. it down for those that are not yeah, so how to calculate that, what's the square right, footage that it's, it's currently at? Thirty thousand square feet. So d doubling the size is. Yes, uh, what we didn't do, and because we're doing this very conservatively, we didn't, this, the uh, entrance garden, which we're taking the roof off the existing building, so that's really not uh, going to be uh, part of the FAR, that, that's about 900 square feet. So it's roughly 30,000 square feet as opposed to what was 15,000 before. So just something to look at when you're going back is, it yeah, would the, be the, 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 the... The thing, of course, is that in order to be able to do, renovation is very expensive, Renovation is old buildings, even more expensive. You have to have a certain, um, and you have to achieve a certain uh, scale uh, of development in order to be able to do a really nice job. And I think you saw that the projections are for a really nice looking building. And I think that's what we're looking to produce. And in order to, um, to, to, to actually, to be able to produce that, we need to have sufficient rents, and the rents aren't going to be tremendous. You know, they're not going to be terribly high. Like they're not the rent projection is not three thousand dollars for a, a, a unit, but they'll be priced for young adults and others who want to live in uh, in close to town. Uh, certainly, not taking issue with the pricing of the rest. My the one issue I was trying to raise for you to look at when you go I back understand. on this. We'll, we'll look at that, but it's a it's a function of being able to build the building. Right. So just going back to what the point I was trying to make, which was again the size of the project, whether it can be square footage reduction or whether it can be, as Mr. Brown suggested, maybe playing with the units themselves, it's less units of a larger size or something like that where the parking uh, calculations may change. All right, I'm gonna, yes. Okay. okay. Mr. Bruno. I really have kind of a comment on this, Mr. Shimano. Uh, in, in our general approach, I've just, the board overall has been looking for parking, even downtown Bayshore. We've gone kind of strict, and I have to admit, I'm kind of a bit picky on this. Um, the part that bothers me, and I think the part about the, you know, the movie theater and somebody said, you know, they're there a couple hours, then they leave, is a very valid one. The thing that I'm finding a little difficult is that your apartment dwellers I don't know that we have other projects where apartment dwellers are parking on somebody else's property overnight. Okay. I know that we've, we've taken a point where in downtown Bayshore, for example, even though we've given some large parking relaxations, there still have been enough parking spaces to at least account for one car, I believe, 
uh, for each apartment. So I just, I'd like you to look at that. I'm a little concerned about the fact that you provide no parking, but you have residents. So that's where I'm, I'm making the distinction. Okay. Mr. Well, um, there are, I mean, there's a multitude of uh, different buildings in Bayshore. Some have parking and some don't. My son lived on, lived in one off of Maple, I think. And uh, they actually parked in the town lot behind it. So that was probably an exception to what you're talking about. Um, and that's where, you know, when he graduated from law school, that's where he first lived. Uh, and actually loved it. But he, he, this building has never had parking. It was built without parking. Uh, it was improved and the board granted without parking, which and, and for use it required much more parking. The fact is, and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Ethan to come up and address the board with regard to the actual utilization of Smith Street and the parking and how that's going to work. Uh, because I think uh, the actual amount of traffic produced by the residents is in peak hours, which is the important time, um, should be uh, noted by the board. Um, that's okay, I'll ask Mr. to come up and just address that to the board. I think it needs to. Hi. Um, so I, I just want to clarify something from the re report. Um, the, the traffic and parking projections that were made for the report uh, use industry standards, which the way we do traffic and parking projections is we look at data that's published nationally from the Institute of Transportation Engineers. So for a variety of land uses, um, they, they take data from across the country or regionally specific, and they um, create parking or traffic rates based on the, the number of units or the square footage or, or anything of that sort. Um, we did projections obviously for the restaurant and for the residential use. And that residential use, even though there are 23 units, um, I, I think there was one of the public comments mentioned um, like 46 parking stalls. Well, we don't find that that's the case based on our research, uh, based on our research from Institute of Transportation Engineers, we found for like a 23 unit mid-rise apartment, you'd have a parking demand of 28. So a little bit over the number of... I'm just gonna ask not to interrupt the speaker. We're trying to keep a record, thank you. So th that would be for the overnight residential use. Uh, so obviously overnight, the, the restaurant uh, doesn't have any parking demand, it, it wouldn't be open. So. Uh, with that in account, and, and if we look at an AM peak hour, you know, so the morning peak hour um, uh, of the adjacent roadways, the, the residential traffic demand is only, uh, based on our research, six exiting vehicles. So generally, you know, we look at uh, either 50 vehicles turning left at an intersection or 100 vehicles leaving a site as, as the threshold to, to do a more uh, complicated traffic analysis and traffic capacity analysis. So, capacity analysis. Thing. So, you know, obviously, uh, this this development um, depends on the Smith Avenue lot and the, and the capacity at that lot. And based on our projections and assuming the restaurant was open for breakfast, which I, I doubt that be the case, um, but maybe someone else can speak to that. Assuming it would, had a breakfast use, uh, only 19 vehicles would be exiting lot five uh, during the AM peak hour. So, you know, based on the distributions of traffic on East Main Street that we uh, got from New York State Department of Transportation, that means exiting lot five would be about nine vehicles would turn left and, and go up to Main Street and about 10 vehicles might turn right and, and go down Smith Avenue in order to get back to a traffic signal. Um, again, usually the threshold for an impact of traffic to an intersection is about 50 is when we start to really um, uh, see an impact and, and study for the level of service and, and things like that. Are there any questions maybe on our traffic or parking analysis? Thank you. 
question either for Mr. Germano or Ms. Ryan. Did anyone speak with the fire department? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I met with the ISA fire department and with the commissioners and we um, showed them the site plan and uh, they gave us some feedback in terms of um, the maneuverability of the fire apparatus. Um, we conveyed that back to the site design professionals and said that we would certainly make accommodations to make sure that there were no obstructions and they seemed to be satisfied with that. And just for the, the question regarding if the project were approved construction, I know there was a concern about blocking the parking for the building next to it. And I can Ms. Colvin talk about sort of the requirements for construction that they do have to abide by uh, certain rules. And if they don't, that there is an enforcement provision or code enforcement can go out there. So that is something I tell you, if it is approved, um, our cards are up here and um, if we've had other projects where there are problems where, you know, easily uh, in touch with the applicant and uh, sending code enforcement out there if there were in fact to be a problem. So we're cognizant of that if it were to be approved that we'd make sure that you had that number to call if there were any issues. And we would stress that with the applicant as well. And the applicant understands that and also understands the need to keep the roads open, the road open for the fire department. So we're prepared to work with the town and the fire department with regard to that. I know Mr. Frujari suggested, you know, looking at those two off road parking spot, well, drop off pickup. What is the intent of the use of right now? Is it valet service? Is it just no, dropping? We, no, no, it's, we know parking there. The intent of that was a drop off for the apartment. So people who were bringing packages in could drop the packages off. So if the uh, uh, FedEx truck comes, there's a place for them to pull in and, dry, and, and drop their packages off. The whole point of that was not to block the road. That's what it's for. It's not for parking. And then my other question is, if this were to go forward and be approved, there are certain conditions that currently exist at the Smith Street parking lot or on the beginning of the roadway. Is the applicant amenable to speak into the town about possible improvements that would be made at the applicant's expense to improve that area? The applicant is um, willing to enter into discussions with the town. Thank you. There are further questions? Discussions with the town with regard to the Smith Street parking lot. Anything further from the board? Would the applicant like to add anything further? Um, uh, well, the obvious, I will, you know, just one, one more comment, and that is that almost any other use, office space, commercial space, would actually, under the ISIL code, require more parking for a 15,000 square foot building on one floor. So, I mean, our, we believe that this is really one of the lower uh, uses, lower uh, traffic producing uses that can be put into the building and and allow for the creative redevelopment. Um, and I just note also that uh, the town's traffic consultant um, essentially agreed that there was sufficient parking in the area uh, for the use as proposed. That's our, that's it. Thank you. And the plan is reviewed the traffic study? Yeah, okay, thank you. If there are nothing further from the board, is there a motion? Mr. Furchier. I'll make a motion that we close this public hearing and reserve decision on the application so that we can consider the comments we heard tonight. It's a motion by Mr. Frujari to close the public hearing and reserve decision. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Brown. All in favor? Aye. Opposed abstentions. The application is reserved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board for hearing us tonight. Just going to give it two minutes for everyone to clear out, then we can go to the decision items. Obviously, anybody who wants to stay for those, please feel free to stay. But uh, Rose Rack, if you're here, please come on up and uh, prepare. Can you, Wendy? Wendy. Right. Okay. You went this yeah. Can you give a card, Sean's card, maybe? Yeah, we'll give somebody to speak to about that. Yeah, we'll get you all the information. Well, there's somebody you can speak to that can answer those questions. Yeah, you can call us. If you're here, you can stop over one day, too. Yeah.
Right. When they'll give you a card, you can certainly should reach, give a call and. Spelling. Thank you for Thank your you. comments. Thanks. Oh no, we, I don't. There's nobody here. No. Yeah, there's nobody here that disagrees with that. I'm gonna. Okay, we're going to go back on the record for the second item on the agenda, town board application, site plan modification, decision item. Item two on the agenda, site plan modification, decision item, Rose Rack, LLC. S Everybody good? Okay. Back on the record, site plan modification decision item, Rose Rack LLC, SP 2019-050, east side of Freeman Avenue, number zero, 560 feet south of Spur Drive South, Islip, applicant request of park and relaxation in connection with the construction of a mini storage warehouse facility. Good evening to the applicant. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Scott DeBerardino. I'm a registered architect. It's DeBerardino. It's D-I-B-E-R-A-R-D-I-N-O with offices at 319 Sunrise Highway in West Islip. Uh, also have with me from Rose Rack, uh, Michael Racanelli. R-A-C-A-N-E-L-L-I. So we have been working with um, both planning and engineering to develop a mini self storage facility, which consists of three buildings. Uh, there's two that are, one's 4,200, the next is 4,800. And then uh, those are both one story. Uh, and then the southernmost building, which is 64,000 square feet, which is a three story building. Um, all three of which consist of superior architecture, which we've been working with uh, planning as well to get the facades of the buildings developed. Um, in the process, we have uh, currently 25% landscaping, uh, but the project does require 16 parking spaces we have 13 and we're requesting a relaxation for those other three spaces, which equates to 18.75% relaxation. Um, in addition to what's shown on the site plan, the first floor plan of the larger building actually consists of two additional spaces that are within the building space where someone would be able to come in and pull out of the weather um, and unload or load as they uh, would need to. So there are an additional two spaces offered up uh, within the building. They're just not physically shown on the site plan itself. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the parking for this type of facility, it's not typical to what would be uh, an office where somebody would come in at 8 o'clock, park a vehicle, and be there until 12, leave for an hour, come back, and then be there until 5 o'clock. Most of uh, the parking for these types of facilities is in and out 10, 15 minutes, somebody comes in, they drop something off, they're out, um, or you know that happens a few times a day, but generally traffic flow is fairly low on these types of sites. Um, so as a result of the, the applicant's uh, desire for a floor area ratio of one, the superior architecture and the 25% landscaping in lieu of the 20, uh, we've achieved. Uh, the result, unfortunately, is that we are short three spaces, which is what we're here respectfully requesting is that relaxation for those three, which again was 18.75%. Thank you. 
you picked a tough app application to go after with uh, parking relaxation, but based on that, I'm going to go to Mr. Gonzalez to give a staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this industrially one zoned, uh, almost two acre site is currently vacant. It was subdivided off from the soon to be eight acre Gracewood Estates apartments that were part of uh, application CZ 2016 005. Uh, before you tonight is the site plan for that remaining 1.7 acres for a new mini storage facility. Uh, it will comprise of three separate buildings with the main site access off Freeman Avenue. A separate connection to the east adjacent to Gracewood will be for emergency fire access only. That'll be closed with a gate and not uh, usable uh, under normal circumstances. The applicant must go to the ZBA for an FAR of 0.99. However, tonight the only request is a three stall parking relaxation, 16 required, 13 provided. As uh, the applicant mentioned, these types of uses are very low traffic generators. The need for parking is quite minimal. Uh, the applicant did retain Island Structures Engineering PC to provide a short traffic and parking analysis. Um, based on that data, the minimal need for parking on site is valid. In addition to the 13 stalls on site, as spoken uh, by the applicant, two spaces are available for uh, interior to the larger building in a loading area. Three of the parallel stalls on the north side of the larger building are in front of perimeter storage units. Perimeter storage units. Uh, the applicant states the typical visit is around 20 minutes and in this case should not pose a real issue. Staff had previously discussed with the applicant that if feasible, those two interior parking stalls would help alleviate any potential issues as well. Based on the above, if the board finds no issue with the parking, staff has prepared the attached site mod conditions for approval. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Any questions from the board? Anything further from the applicant? Good answer. Yes, Is there a motion? Mr. Moriarty. There's a motion by Mr. Moriarty to grant the application. Is there a se subject to covenants and restrictions? <laughs> Is there a second to that? Second by Mr. Matamore. All in favor? Opposed, abstention. The application is granted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. Third item on the agenda, planning board application. Decision item, Danielle Morazzo, PB 2021-006, South Sider, Brookville Court, approximately 300 feet east of Broadway Avenue, Holbrook. 8 Brookville Court, I'm sorry, Bookville Court, applicant requests a modification of planning board conditions in connection with the encroachment of a pool patio and shed in a required 15 foot natural buffer per file map number 11401. Is the applicant here? Okay, no applicants. So I'm going to go right to Mr. Gonzalez. We'll give those out so you can give a report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This application had a public hearing on March 24th of this year. Decision was reserved in order for staff to gather more information about the building permit that was filed for, the property deed, and additional survey information. The property deed was obtained and did not mention the natural buffer. However, the final survey on record from when the home was CO'd in 2007 did show the natural buffer. The plan on file at the building department for the proposed pool showed the natural buffer. And per the building permit record, the zoning division notified the applicant slash owner about the buffer before the permit was issued. There was questions at the hearing whether the shed could actually be moved in regards to existing mature trees in the area. An engineering inspector went to the site on September 28th, and based on site photos that were taken, there is sufficient room to relocate the shed and the items behind it out of that natural buffer. Based on that, staff is recommending the shed and other outdoor furniture behind it be relocated out of the buffer, evergreen trees be planted in its place, and the pool patio encroachment be granted to remain. All of these recommendations are in the attached planning board conditions which have been signed by the applicant. 
Yes. Thank you. Based on that, any questions for Mr. Gonzalez? Not seeing any. Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brown. I'd like to make a motion uh, based on CNRs being executed to grant the application. It's a motion by Mr. Brown based on the CNRs being executed to grant the application. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Bruno. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The application is granted. Item four on the agenda, planning board application decision item, Seventh Day Adventists, PB 2020-018, Northeast corner of 2nd Avenue and Carlton Avenue, County Route 17, Central Islip, 60 Carlton Avenue. Applicant requests a planning board special permit for a mixed use building in the business district pursuant to 68-257.1G. Site plan modifications are requested as part of this application. Good evening to the applicant. Good evening, my name is Jessica Lees, L-E-I-S with uh, offices at 333 Earl Ovington Boulevard in Uniondale, New York. Um, I represent the applicant. I also have with me this evening, um, we have our uh, traffic expert, uh, Robert Eschbacher from VHB, uh, and we have two representatives from the church here as well, Lloyd Scharfenberg, which is the secretary to the board's organization, and Fausto Flores, who's the treasurer of the, of the church. Um, sure. So... Uh, I got it right. Lloyd Scharfenberg is L L O Y D S C H A R F F E N B E R G. Uh, Fausto Flores, I believe, is F A U S T O, and then Flores uh, F L O R E Z or S S. Okay. Um, do you do Robert? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we, we we did appear before this board um, last year, um, re re requesting the special permit um, to have the mixed use uh, and relaxation of the code for parking. Um, since that time, we had retained Robert Eschbacher, and he prepared a report, um, two reports actually, during um, one in January of 2021, and then since that was during COVID, um, some COVID restrictions still in place, he prepared an additional report. Um, this past September, um, September 27th of 2021, um, and that was to address some concerns with the um, on-site, the insufficiency and the request for the modification uh, waiver for um, the full required on-site parking. Um, based upon the report, I, I would offer, if anyone has any questions for Mr. Ashbacher, he is there this evening. Um, but we have reviewed, uh, received and reviewed um, the conditions, the proposed planning board special permit conditions, as well as the um, site plan conditions. Um, the, and we, we um, are in agreement with them. Um, the only one condition that um, my client did request is uh, number two on the planning board special permit conditions. They did indicate that they would desire to occasionally have um, prayer service early in the morning prior to 8 a.m. and it's a small group of people. Um, that was the only thing that they wanted me to bring to the board's attention. It does put 8 a.m. as the restriction for the time in the morning. Um, but otherwise, as far as the parking, if you have any questions, I do have Robert Ash Parker here. Thank you. I'm going to go to Ms. Wozniak for a report and then we'll come back for questions. Can you give her the microphone, Gary, or Mike? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since the public hearing, the applicant conducted another parking study in order to evaluate more current parking conditions. As the first parking study was conducted last December during the height of the COVID pandemic, the new study was conducted on Saturday, September 25th, which is when the church holds their most attended weekly service. This study showed that during the hours of 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., there was a parking shortfall and on-street parking did occur on 2nd Avenue. It is important to note that the study also stated simultaneous use of the two larger areas would not occur at the same time and that peak demand only occurs for several hours on Saturday mornings. However, parking during weddings or other holidays or events may pose a concern on other days of the week. This parcel is also located within the DRI corridor, which will work to establish commercial and residential redevelopment in this depressed social economic neighborhood. There are few existing on-street and off-street parking opportunities in this area. 
the planning board would be establishing a precedent in granting an 88% off street parking relaxation. The redevelopment of this area without ancillary on-site parking is just not sustainable. Planning recommends denial of the 88% off street parking relaxation and asks that the applicant work with staff to reduce the parking relaxation to mitigate the adverse impact on the available parking that is in the area. However, should the board feel comfortable with the parking study and the parking relaxation, planning recommends the attached conditions which restrict expansion of the sanctuary or fellowship hall and requires any change of use that requires a parking relaxation to come back before this board. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, my only question, either from Ms. Wozniak, for the applicant is, you know, based upon the report, I think the one, the one time on Saturday is not an issue and not a problem to have the church service and be a parking relaxation request. But it's whether or not, you know, evening. You mentioned other things that go on there. Are, just, is there, are there any restrictions for weddings or parties or other religious events that go on party-wise? So I was informed that the large-scale events are not going to take place. They're certainly not going to be renting out the space to any third parties. Um, the, they are comfortable with putting restrictions on the amount of people that could be in there in attendance for any events. Um, we did, I, I should also bring up that we did try to seek out um, across the street, there is another church facility. They actually don't have their own on-site parking. And we had made efforts to reach out to the people there to, to figure out where their parking takes place and if there is shared opportunities and there was not. Um, there is municipal lots adjacent to that um, facility across the street. And it's our understanding that, I mean, it doesn't seem to be in operation at this time, but um, previously used the municipal lots. Um, the applicants are certainly aware that they need to utilize the municipal lots. Um, again, in the study that was done recently, it, it indicated that there was an excess and availability of um, parking. And I mean, I, I could certainly ask Mr. Eschbacher to come up, um, but they are, they're very willing to accept restrictions on large scale events. Um, they understand that, you know, there, there can be a cap on those. Um, you know. Yeah, on the church service itself, I think, um, based on the report, I think that's I'm comfortable with. I just want to make sure that, and I don't know the facility itself, is there like a, we're looking it up now in terms of a space in there that could be used for weddings and stuff like that, that or is it just a church with pews and, and the rest in there? That's, there is a fellowship hall, um, right. and it's more events. I, I, I was speaking with the treasurer this evening, um, they have started broadcasting their services online, as most other, um, you know, public assembly places have started doing. It seems that the parishioners are much more, uh, seem to enjoy that much more. Um, they do plan on continuing it into the future. So as far as that goes from pre-COVID times, it seems that attendance has decreased on the actual site and people are utilizing online services. Um, our plans. Oh, there's two of them. Okay. Hey, Kelly, just for clarification, I see there are two different, uh, in the packet itself, there are two different sets of covenants and restrictions. Am I missing? Right. Is this one on this one? One special one, one special one. Okay, so this, so you're currently in the special permit. You're restricting the use already for weddings. Okay, so it does currently restrict the use, right? I'm just looking at condition five here, which says the church may not hold weddings, funerals, or other events unless a prior arrangement for offsite. Church may not hold weddings, funerals, or other events unless a prior arrangement for offsite parking has been made. Okay, so that's the condition. The applicant is okay with that condition? They are, they are acceptable to that condition. Okay, if the applicant's okay with that condition, then I think I'm satisfied. Anything further from the board? And Ms. Wozniak, you're okay with that as a condition should restrict, deal with the parking issue? 
If the board is acceptable, if the board is not, they will make it work with the time frames. Um, they indicated that it's very rare, but occasionally they have an early morning and it's very few people that show up to it. What time is the early morning? Uh, 6 a.m. Is there... Is there an opinion from the board on that? Anyone have questions on that? So it's condition number two on the first set. Not hearing any concerns with that? I'm guessing that, Ms. Wozniak, any concerns on your end? Okay, I think that the answer is we're amenable to that. Thank you. So just to say that's condition number two in the, which the first one is which uh, document? So planning board special permit conditions, item number two is going to change from six from 8 a.m. to 6 a.m. And is that Sunday through Thursday as well as Friday and Saturday or just certain? The 6 a.m. Saturday. So it's the 6 a.m. Friday and Saturday, then that would change to 6 a.m. Okay. Anything further from the applicant? That's it. Thank you. Anything further from the board? Is there a motion? Mr. Brown. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to grant the application based on the specifics of number two that you just read into the record and the conditions being signed by the applicant. It's a motion by Mr. Brown to grant the application subject to item number two and the planning board special permit conditions being changed from 8 a.m. to 6 a.m. on Friday and Saturday and subject to the covenants and restrictions of both being signed. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Matamor, all in favor? Aye. Opposed abstentions, the application is granted. Thank you. That's why I'd like to bring the first set of conditions. Okay, planning board application decision item, Robert Mazzoli, PB 2021-017, west side of Acorn Avenue, 100 feet north of Brightside Avenue, Central Islip, 264 Acorn Avenue. Applicant requests planning board special permits for a vehicle repair shop and the open and the outside overnight parking of registered vehicles as necessary to be permitted use pursuant to 68-340.1B and C, respectively. Site plan modifications may also be requested as part of this application. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Alyssa Solarsh, S-O-L-A-R-S-H hyphen A-L-Y-S-S-A. Solarsh hyphen Sinatra, S I N A T R A, of Germano and Cahill, PC, 4250 Veterans Memorial Highway, Suite 275, Holbrook, New York, for the applicant, Robert Mazzoli. Also in attendance with me is Joseph Clemens of German and Clemens Architecture, PC. The applicant has taken into consideration the board's comments from the prior meeting held on May 26, 2021, and has made substantial changes um, to the proposed site plan. As you recall, uh, the original application used, um, proposed two uses for the premises. The applicant is now seeking special permits to use the site only as an auto repair shop with overnight parking of registered vehicles as an accessory use. Um, the proposed plan meets the town's requirements for parking, landscaping, and will result in an overall improvement to the site. The proposed conditions that were circulated by planning staff are acceptable to the applicant, so the applicant um, respectfully requests that the application be granted. We're here to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Wozniak for a report, and we'll come back for any questions. Thank you. Um, since the public hearing, the applicant has withdrawn the request for the outdoor overnight parking of six trucks in connection with the paving business, and has decided to move forward with the special permit for the vehicle repair only. The applicant has slightly adjusted the proposed site plan, now showing compliant paving and a small accessory building on site to provide additional storage for the vehicle repair use which will require planning board approval for overhead doors facing the street. Other than the overhead door relaxation, there are no other relaxations required from this board. The applicant is meeting the required parking, landscaping, and buffers. 
The applicant is also providing screening along Acorn Avenue to screen the vehicles from view as is required by the code. Based on this and the improvements being made to the site overall, planning recommends the board grant the relaxation subject to the attached conditions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Anything further from the applicant? No. Is there a motion? Mr. Moriarty. Uh, I Motion by Mr. Moriarty to grant the application subject to the conditions. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Bruno. All in favor? Aye. Opposed abstentions. The application is granted. Thank you. Thank you. Item six on the agenda, town board application recommendation item, Dennis DeVivo, CZ2021-012, Southeast Corner of Union Boulevard, County Route 50 and Pat Drive, West Islip, 718 Union Boulevard. Applicant requests a modification of covenants and restrictions associated with TC3910 in order to expand the mixed-use building. Site plan modifications are required as part of this application. Mr. Colgan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This application was previously heard on May 26th of this year. Primary issue raised at that time was parking and finding optimal locations for additional parking should the demand increase over the status quo. The applicant has removed the proposed land bank stall and instead showed them behind the existing driveway and along the walkway in the front yard. This will minimize the disruption to the residential appearance that the general service T district is designed to achieve. The plan also shows a single row of evergreens to be planted in the rear yard as a buffer. Lastly, the applicant has requested a waiver of site plan review. The planning board is authorized to do so with the finding that the waiver will not adversely affect existing drainage, topography, traffic circulation, intensity of land use, landscaping, buffers, lighting, and other considerations of site plan approval, and that existing conditions do not require additional or improved site improvements. The finding must also include a discussion of the current use of the site, the proposed use and its negligible impact. The only proposed changes to the site currently is the building expansion. It's possible that drainage issues from the expansion could be addressed via the building plans examiner's review. As there is no current approved site plan, the town is not determined if there are any other underlying engineering issues that might need to be addressed as it has never been looked at. If the board is satisfied that no engineering complaints have been received to date, then the board can opt to waive the review and approve the site plan shown before you tonight. The staff would suggest at a minimum that if there are other improvements required by other municipal agencies, such as Suffolk County Department of Public Works, that the board reserve to the planning commissioner the final decision on site plan review if there are substantial changes to the proposed site plan that may significantly alter the mechanics of the site. Aside from that, uh, the staff has no objection to the application as proposed and recommends the board grant the application subject to the attached covenants and restrictions and for the applicant to obtain all necessary variances from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Colgan? Mr. Brown. Yep. Yeah, Sean, this... Um... Just trying to remember what the heck my question was. <laughs> so the, the site plan, we originally, um, they were going to put parking on the other side. Right. So that we all agreed at the time, I think at the public hearing and everything, not to do that. And so it's going to be the existing parking. Right. So, and this is going to be a owner occupied uh, residence. Yeah, we agree to that. Okay. So with, with that being said, I have no issues with it. That are required that Sean said so that we can... Yes. Um, based on Sean's report with the findings and reserving the right to the commissioner, um, I would make a motion to grant the application. This is a motion by Mr. Brown. First, a statement by Mr. Brown that, based upon Mr. Colgan's report, that we're satisfied mm -hmm. that the findings have been met to waive site plan review. Am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. And that uh, we reserve the right mm -hmm. for the planning commissioner, if in fact there are any issues that arise from Suffolk County or any other entity 
making I don't know what I'm saying, making or improvements or requiring improvements. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop there. Is there a second to that uh, motion? Second by Mr. Fruj. Subject second by Ms. Frujari. That's my motion or Kevin's motion. Subject to the covenants and restrictions being executed. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Application is granted. Um, Tim, I know you had a motion. What was it, number seven? Oh, number seven has been uh, adjourned. Oh, okay. Any covenants and restrictions with that? There's a motion by Mr. Madam Moore to uh, close this hearing and adjourn the meeting. Second by Mr. Moriarty. All in favor, opposed, abstentions, we're adjourned. Thank you. One abstention. Okay.